What are the biggest issues facing Hawaii state lawmakers in 2020? Will they raise the minimum wage? Will the lack of affordable housing be on the agenda? How will they address the issue of climate change and its effect on our shorelines and lifestyle? Will they consider legalizing recreational marijuana? Join the conversation as legislative leaders and community watchdogs preview the 2020 session. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The legislature opens its 2020 session Wednesday. Bills introduced last year that did not pass are still alive, such as proposals to raise the minimum wage, and thousands of new bills will be introduced as well. What happens over the Capitol over the next 100 plus days will be scrutinized by the news media, consumer groups, and people like you watching tonight. Joining us tonight to give us a preview of what's to come are two veteran state lawmakers, a longtime political reporter, and the leader of a government watchdog group. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. And now I have to tell you that because of some technical problems, I can't show you the usual screen with all the numbers on it. So I'm gonna give you the numbers. So if you wanna get a pencil or some other primitive way of writing numbers down, I'm gonna tell you what those are. On Oahu, you need to call 462-5000, 462-5000 on Oahu. Neighbor Islands can call 800-238-4847. And I'm going to repeat that. For neighbor islanders, it's 800-238-4847. Our email is insights at pbsy.org, insights at pbsy.org. And our Twitter feed handle is hashtag PBS Insights. And so, folks, uh, we are still up there. We've got volunteers ready to take in your calls, stuff, even if we don't have the graphics because of slight technical problems today. Now let me move on and introduce our guests, Senator Kalani English has represented the Canoe District that includes parts of East Maui, Molokai, and Lanai for 20 years. He is the Democratic Majority Leader in the Senate. Representative Gene Ward holds the seat that represents Hawaii Kai and Kalama Valley in East Oahu. He is the Republican Minority Leader in the State House, where he's served since 2006. He also held office from 1990 to 1998. Chad Blair is the Politics and Opinion Editor for Honolulu Civil Beat, but I'm sure he has no opinions. His journalism <laughs> focuses on how to political decisions impact people and communities. And Sandy Ma is the Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii, a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy. Sandy is an attorney with a wide range of nonprofit, corporate, and government experience. Let's start with Senator English. Um, tell us, what will the priorities be for the state senators here? Is there one or two or three you can point to? Well, actually, you know, the Senate uh, operates a little bit differently than in the past. So we have a framework that we work off of well, based on the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, you know, we ask each senator and each committee to take these into consideration as they move their bills forward. So uh, not necessarily a set of bills like we did in the past, but more so um, a policy document. There it is, a policy guidance document. That's last year's one. We're going to publish uh, this session's one uh, very, very soon, the next day or two. We had uh, some graphic designing glitches, so that was the issue. So did we. Yes. Yeah. Well, but in terms of the issues that the people want to know about, they don't really want to know about a structure or a function. Well, yeah, that, but that's a, that's a very good question. So the structure, it's a, you know, uh, the 17 goals are a way of speaking to other people in different parts of the world. But it's been localized, right? So the, these are the issues that we deal with. For instance, you know, um, we're dealing with homelessness. And that's, you know, really dealing with shelter for all one of the goals. Uh, so how do, we, how do we deal with this? And it's a multifaceted approach to it. Isn't, it isn't just, let's go build houses and put people in it. I mean, it could be as simple as that, but we have to deal with the social problems. We have to deal with the inequalities of income. We have to deal with, uh, this, how do we deal with the, the pay, you know, equal pay, better pay for people, but also be fair to the business owners and the people that have to pay the salaries. So the complex questions localized. Um, you know, we're also dealing with climate change. It's the biggest issue before us right now. I mean, the most famous one that we're dealing with right now is Haula, the road falling yeah. into the ocean. But, you know, I have, for two years, roads on Molokai that have been in the ocean. I have the east side ready to get completely cut off. About 10 feet left of a, of a road and the rest of it is falling off for the last two years. Where I live in Hana, the road constantly falls into the ocean. Going to Lahaina on the, on big, on the big island. So, you know, if you add this up, uh, you know, we're dealing with an 
imminent crisis right now. And so we'll deal with that. Okay, let me, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm Senator. sorry, I, I just wanted to Please. add that Common Cause Hawaii appreciates uh, Senator English's use of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, particularly uh, Development Goal number 16, which encourages good policy and governance by holding institutions at all levels accountable. Common Cause, specifically, our motto, motto is holding power accountable, and we think we could really use number 16 of the SDGs to really uh, emphasize how um, all institutions and all uh, elected officials could be held accountable and held to um, account under this SDG number 16. So, so thank so you, let Senator. me ask, just like I did with, with Senator English, is mm -hmm. uh, how, what does Common Cause see as the problem that needs to be fixed by that? Well, so one of our uh, core issues is ethics and reforming ethics and improving ethics in Hawaii. Uh, I think uh, the Star Advertiser had recently conducted a poll saying that uh, the people felt, uh, the people of Hawaii registered voters specifically had felt that uh, uh, there was a lack of uh, ethics and accountability amongst our elected officials. And we think that some ethics reform could be instituted in this uh, upcoming 2020 legislative session. For example, there's a particular bill that we would like to see uh, passed, which is, um, and I think this was also um, highlighted in Chad Blair's uh, Honolulu Civil Beat recently, which is if uh, why are uh, government employees who have been uh, found guilty of a, a crime related to their employment still allowed to keep their pensions? And so we think this is a reform that could be passed in this upcoming session. It's been repeatedly introduced in the last uh, several legislative sessions, <coughs> but has never been passed. And we think that there is some appetite for reform in this upcoming session. And especially, it could be linked back to uh, Senator English's uh, SDG number 16. Interesting. Let me move on. Chad Blair, just uh, uh, give me a little, some meat and potatoes. What do you think <laughs> the, the, the big debates are going to be? Well, Sandy, thank you for saying that it's my civil beat. I wish it was, but it's, uh, it's your civil beat. Everybody out there, we are donor supported. Uh, but thank you for, uh, for recognizing us. And I would love to talk about uh, climate change. But meat and potatoes is what you want. I think minimum wage is the one issue that made it right near the end. But it, it died in conference committee in the very last day. And Aaron Johansson, the House Judiciary Chair, and Brian Taniguchi, the Senate, excuse me, labor chair, labor chair, couldn't come up with an agreement. There are all sorts of problems with that bill. I hear quite a lot of movement uh, that they may be moving towards a figure that they can agree on. I don't know if it's $17 an hour. I don't know if it's $15 an hour. But right now, it's $10.10 an hour, and that's just unacceptable for many people. At the same time, to your point earlier, Senator, uh, businesses are concerned. And part of the reason that the bills died last session is they couldn't agree on how to deal with tip people credits. that, yeah, tip credits, how to deal with whether you should have a tax credit if you have to provide insurance to mm -hmm. your employees under the Prepaid <clears throat> Health Care Act. There was even a proposal to have state uh, or state government officials getting $17 an hour, but maybe $15 an hour for others. Was that fair? So those things broke that down, but my guess is they won't pull it out of conference committee. They'll probably start with a new bill. So new bills, guess, rather. Gene Ward, uh, Representative, Minority Leader in the State House, what do you see the big debates being this year? I see we're down in the weeds already because we got to really focus on the economy. We, right now we have a state with an economy that doesn't fit the needs of the people. We need to grow the economy. I know that's something that doesn't get focused on, but if we don't grow the economy, we got 70% of the people who are kind of making it, but 30% of the people are failing. They've got double jobs, they've got problems, they're migrating to the mainland. Is it fair to say they're failing or is it they don't have a chance? Well, they're using transfer payments. They're not independent on their own ability to survive and their confidence level in the drug use and all the, the, the syndrome that no, makes... The drug use is it, across all sectors of society, yeah. though, so how can you just... You uh, want to talk about the homeless and drugs? Or no, but, but what? you just said... I what, mean, I'm what talking saying about is across all sectors. Those who are becoming able to function and have a life of let, their let, own... Let me just is, give you a chance a to be more, be more specific. But, when you talk about growing the economy, what do you think okay, you're, you're specifically, going to be pushing We have six strategic advantages of which we're only taking uh, care of two. We have defense spending with the military, we have tourism, but we have the potential to be Hollywood of the Pacific. We could be doing movies up to a billion dollars. I just talked to the film office the other day. But we don't do it because the tax credit we haven't been able to do. We could be the, because of the East-West Center, of which Kalani and I have an affiliation with, we could be the Geneva of the Pacific. We could be having all of the East-West Center, the Asia-Pacific Security Studies Center. We could have that modified. 
We could be doing the sports center of the Pacific, the arenas for both the UFC, for the golf, all the things that we're doing. We could multiply doing that. And lastly, we could be the space center of which we have already the head of astronomy. We are the best in the world. The point is we're not thinking economic development. We're thinking, well, we get bogged down in the weeds, but if the macro of economic development is there, seeing that we have an economy that doesn't fit the needs of the people. We just haven't done that. We haven't diversified. We've talked about it. In fact, Darrell, 20 years ago, probably the issues tonight we're still talking about, there's a lack of confidence that we in, in the government and other places have the ability to just solve people's problems. Let me ask uh, That's Senator, a real problem. Senator Kalani English. A lack English. of confidence. Answer that question, and, and Sandy Ma from Common Cause also brought this up, this lack of confidence in government. And what is it that needs to change or happen to signal to people that they can trust the legislature that they have, they can trust the leadership that they have well, I don't, to I don't, deal with their problems? I don't know if we'll ever, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if we'll ever get to that particular goal of, you know, having trust. I mean, we live in a society where it's based on mistrust and everything is based on not believing. I mean, social media has conditioned us to do that. Media itself it says we don't trust. And so the goal of, you know, creating trust, I think the goal is to look at the outcomes and look at judge by the outcomes what has been done. Um, you know, we don't trust media because we're told not to trust media. Media doesn't trust us. Well, are there, outcomes, doesn't, are there outcomes then that haven't been reported? No, but there's, I mean, that's what I mean, that the outcomes that we're doing, we're working on is how they should be judged. But uh, Senator, we have a 27% approval rating, 51% disapprove of the job we're doing. They think that we're all about ourselves and don't care about the people. This is the Star Advertiser poll. Yeah, then that's simply a poll. I mean, you know, the point is that... It doesn't make us look very good, does it? No, but we can do other polls that make us look good. I mean, it just depends who you uh, poll. The, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I want to uh, give Sandy Ma a chance. No. Go ahead, you run it. Oh, well, I, I, I think... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. There. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, trust in government. Yeah, trust no, in trust government. in government. Uh, yes, we we have to restore trust in government. We have to hold power accountable through um, passing some su substantive uh, uh, ethics reforms. And and I, we go back to that. Common cause goes back to passing some su substantive voter. Um, ethics reforms. Yeah. You know, let, let me just clarify sure. some things, right? I mean, the idea is that we we do want trust. We do want people to trust us. And it's about a new way of reaching out, a new way of having that discussion with the, with the general population, creating innovative partnerships, and, you know, putting it out. And, and I mean, basically, we're back to that Madisonian-Jefferson debate of the early founding of the, the republic, which was, are we a democracy or are we a republic? Are we direct democracy, which is what more and more people want, right? But we actually operate in a representative republic. So. You're, you elect representatives that represent a constituency. Mm -hmm. People are more and more asking for, I want direct democracy. I want to take a poll. I want to vote but on this. Let me just ask this question, though. Isn't it because the perception people have is that we have these chronic problems that haven't been solved by our government leaders, and that's where the heart of the, the discontent. I mean, let me, Chad, sure. answer that question. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I would get back first to your point about trust. I think there are two issues. We just finished a decade. We just finished a year. And I would say the two dominant issues really were the Kealoha corruption trial, something that is continuing to this present day, not just mm -hmm. the Honolulu Police Department or the Police Commission. It extends into the prosecutor's office. It extends into corporation counsel. And who knows uh, how much further. And that is continuing right now. We're going to see possibly more situations coming along. And then the other one is rail. Even though we're hearing now it may actually start in October, I'm not sure who's going to want to take the train from East Kapolei to Aloha Stadium. Uh, I'll try and stay hopeful. I live in Makakilo. Well, maybe you would, <laughs> but uh, it won't make it all the way to PBS or it won't make it to Hawaii News now. Uh, but uh, close, getting close into your area. But that is where the level of trust is really something, I mean, the, the fact that that cost level has doubled and that we're still looking at not finishing this thing until, what is the latest projection? 2025. 2025, and so I think that's a real serious concern. But you're also asking what has the, the government done to, what, to fix things? What's it done for me lately? You know, right? <laughs> well, I think it's trying to do things. I gotta give credit to something that I know Sandy was working on, and credit to the House and Senate passing uh, all male voting. Mm -hmm. We're gonna start that this year, and I think you will see hopefully more people exercising they're right. Actually, you know, if you take a look at that, so NCSL, they, they have statistics on this, and they've looked at states that passed it. Usually, the, the first three or four election cycles, voter turnout goes down, and then it goes way up. 
So, you know, that's the, the statistics coming out of NCSL saying, yeah, okay, because people need to get used to it. exact opposite. It goes up in the beginning, and then they get used to it, and then it goes down again. No, and no. hopefully we're going to have some tick up, otherwise it's going to be... Okay. And, and Daryl, um, we just had this report from HUD. Thank God Hawaii now is no longer number one per capita for homelessness. We're down to number two. That's still nothing to be proud of. But there has been some progress statewide. I believe the numbers of homeless statewide, around 6,400 people right now, has dropped about 19% over the last three years. There's still problems with veterans, with unsheltered homeless. Oahu has its own set of struggles. But there are some indications that the government, and that's a state, county, and federal issue, uh, we're actually starting to see some progress. I, did, I, want, to, I want to acknowledge our, our viewers for setting, starting to call in with questions, even though we can't have the numbers down under <laughs> here. Uh, but a viewer calls and says, national statistics just stated Hawaii moved to number two. Yay, behind New York for homelessness per capita. Are we really making a positive difference? Caller still sees as many around town. Gene, do you think that homelessness that is, is going to be a big correct, issue? That is technically correct, but actually Washington, D.C. has the top and then it's New York, and then it's Hawaii. But if you look at the difference between the two, the marginal difference is really nominal. So yeah, we're not in the, in the top one, but we're third. But I tell, we went to the Homeless Task Force, or the, the uh, Homeless Summit, and I asked people, all the things that they say they're doing, the 19%, we did this, we put more people in the housing and all these other things. But in terms of what the perception is, and perception is reality in the business that we're in, the perception is we have not done anything other than kick the can down the road and make homelessness sound good, but when they see it, people don't believe it. So in effect, what we've got is a homeless crisis of which I, st the only hope, in fact, in that whole uh, seminar <clears throat> was Josh Green. The permanent temporary housing in order to get people off the streets. You know, housing first is the mantra. You gotta have people stabilized to be able to sleep in a place so they can get some kind of regularity in their system. If they're gonna get psychological or social or job training, you gotta stabilize where they sleep. Josh Green has got that solution and it's gonna be like one-tenth of the cost of what otherwise the brick and mortar situation is gonna be. Senator Claudia English, the majority leader in the state Senate, on homelessness, um, Ohana Zones was a piece of a multi-piece mm -hmm. uh, effort. Uh, do you, believe the reports that we're, we're doing better or what's yes. your perception yeah i do because uh, you know yes we're doing better and it's it's a it's a process right and that's the thing is that we can't solve it absolutely immediately it won't go away tomorrow but we're changing the circumstances coming up with some creative things that haven't been tried before and i'm seeing the delta i'm seeing the change you know so it is happening um and as long as we you know barring something like uh, another state sending everybody here uh, you know, we, we're, we're on the right path. There's still a long way to go. You know, one of the, one of the chronic issues in homelessness, and our, I know our station's done quite a bit about this, is the, the mentally ill who are on the streets, the lack of beds for people with mental illness, the lack of uh, the ability to involuntarily treat. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that that problem has been solved? I mean, I know Chad, no, you've covered it. Absolutely, absolutely not. not. And then Scott Morishige, the uh, governor's point person on homelessness, said as much that the focus really needs to be on not only mental health but substance abuse, and we need to direct more services. There is a new innovative pilot program called HONU. Forgive me, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's essentially an outreach program to go and, and confront someone who's chronic and say, well, we can give you a ticket or we can direct you to services, mobile center, to help you. And I think that is definitely an area that we need to see more progress. Darrell, I have a Hawaii homeless task force because it was getting so bad when the sweeps would come out of the city and county of Honolulu, out of the city of Honolulu, they would come to Hawaii Kai and, the, and the, the various environs there. But the issue seems to be that well, we've got people who are homeless, we're gonna take them and we're gonna be able to, uh, even if they're in the, lying in public in their feces, because of the ACLU and the laws, you cannot do any treatment to those people unless they give it. 99% of the people that we ask for help, that we ask to give help in Hawaii Kai, say thank you, just don't bother me. The homeless, generally speaking, the homeless people want to be left alone and a lot of people don't even know that they're mentally ill. But the problem is these people cannot help themselves. Abe Lincoln says if the people can't do it, the government should do it for them. I think we've got to come somewhere to a decision that those who can't help themselves 
need to be helped by people. I grieve when I see those homeless people. And they're just Senator there English. wallowing themselves. On, on, on that issue, um, you know, uh, Representative Ward mentioned specifically the, the mini houses and so on. Um, is there a consensus that that's a, a good idea? I mean, that's the Ohana zone piece of the mm -hmm. pie. That's one piece of it, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, we're dealing with layers. It's, it's just layers of different things. So we have to, we deal with one layer, the next layer is there, the next layer. Yes. So, and it's only temporary, so it's, well, it's not permanent. But, you know, let, let's think about this, though. You know, like, uh, I mean, we've created zoning laws in the counties that make it very restrictive to do any kind of homes. I mean, I know families that, you know, in Hana, Molokai, elsewhere, they said, hey, I'd be very happy with a very simple structure on my family land. And then the county says, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that, that's illegal. So, you know, then they have no homes. Well, you're bringing up the issue of affordable housing, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that because I think we had a panel not too long ago here where when I asked all four what is the main thing that people should focus on in terms of change, they all said affordable housing. It's the linchpin issue around which so many other things revolve. Now, I know you've put a lot of money in these big housing funds. Are you guys satisfied, or is anyone in this panel satisfied I, with the progress we've made in getting affordable housing I online? I would say affordable housing, subset, caveat, DHHL, Department of Hawaiian Homes, 100 years ago to this, but less, to this month, less than 10 has got two, well, they got 203,000 acres, and they only have put 9,800 homesteaders on the land. They got 28,000 waiting on the wait list, and the biggest homeless population are, are Hawaiians. If you want to solve the homeless crisis and you want to get housing, get on with the Department of Hawaiian Homeland. But isn't affordable housing it. necessary at all for all oh, Of course. Okay, Stanley so Chang has got the Singapore model, which I think is still being worked through. But that's a pretty expensive one, and you've got to have political will, like Lee Kuan Yew when he ran Singapore. Chad, what do you think? I don't think we're ready for an authoritarian government <laughs> here. I, I second that <laughs> as, uh, as common cause. You know, we, we want a, a democracy that works and not an authoritarian yes. regime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you asked, are we satisfied with uh, more money for the rental housing trust fund and, and this and that and so forth? I think uh, Senator English is right. It, it's incremental. You, you make progress. You can't do it overnight. I do have some sympathy with the minority leader's view, though, that anecdotally, boy, just driving here tonight, coming down Nimitz, the rain's pouring down, and I saw people huddling in their tents right there in the rain, and it, it does it, it it's, does grab your heart. And Our society should not have to have that yeah. as it is with the richness that we have. In the, but it's not going to be done overnight, and I think that's why we have to be patient and keep directing funds in this regard. You know, well, I, 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 I'm sorry. Ahead, sorry. I, I would like to take this all Don't back apologize. to... Go, go no, no. <laughs> I'd like to take this back to the fundamental... Um, problem that we don't have people who vote in our own best interests. Uh, so if we look back at our voting numbers, um, we have 1.4 million people living in the state. About a million people are um, uh, permitted to vote who are citizens who can vote. We have about uh, 700,000 people who are registered to vote, but only uh, at the last election, uh, about 350,000 people who voted. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, um, 350,000 people uh, are determining uh, the direction of the state for 1.4 million uh, you know, uh, you people. You bring up a very interesting point because vote by mail might change that mix slightly. It might not add a lot of people, but it might change. But my question is, do you think that if you had a better representation of people voting, that there would be more pressure? And what issue do you think people would want to see addressed? Um, Common Cause does not care what issue people uh, want to see addressed. We just want people to vote. And then we could change the direction of our government. If people want to vote on, for example, climate change issues, to make that the priority, then please vote. If people want to change, as uh, Rep. Ward would like, probably, I don't know, I'm not want, I don't want to speak for Rep. Ward, uh, for economic issues to promote uh, business interests, please go ahead and do so. We just want people to vote because this is a, a democratic society. We want people to vote. We have 1.4 million people living in the state. One million can vote, but only 350,000 vote. So. But no, I'm going to stop you for a second because we also want people to participate in this show. Yes. So I'm going to. You got to have two-party system if you're going to have a democracy. Just voting with only one party—that's one party. No, no, rule. that's the choice of the people. Okay, I want to give our viewers these phone numbers. So hold on for a second. So once again, on Oahu, four six two five thousand. On Oahu, four six two five thousand. Neighbor Islands, eight hundred two three eight. 
800-238-4847. That's 800-238-4847. And our email is insights at pbsy.org. Or choice to vote uh, it, not yeah. let me no, let me just go let me just finish off on the affordable housing piece do you see I, Colbert Matsumoto was uh, on this show uh, as part of an executive roundtable and he threw out the idea of if you really want to have affordable housing built in the state one simple solution is just to put a moratorium on building permits for housing that is targeted for above a certain income level you just say you know, we're not going to build houses for people in the top 1% and the top 2%. We're just not going to build that stuff for a while. What do you think of that kind of a dramatic idea? How does a dramatic idea like that tend to fly at the state legislature? That isn't going to happen. Yeah. No, but a, a dramatic idea, any it's dramatic the idea. Singaporean model, I think, that she said that she does not agree with. Okay, but is there a big idea about There's a big idea saying 3% of our population, all of our population lives on 3% of the land. Some of the developers told me if you want to get more housing, affordable housing and other housing, you've got to release some of the land. We have a Do you agree? Basically, I think there's agreement yeah. on that. Well, that's what I'm saying. The zoning, you know, right. at least I can speak from Maui County, right? right? I mean, the zoning has become, it's been used as a tool to stop development. And so it, it's been very effective, which means, you know, I know families, that, uh, old families that live up country that are trying to say, okay, I have seven kids and I have enough land to give it to them, but I can't get the subdivision done. Mm. Because now the county is saying I have to do all of these things. And then they want me to put in all this infrastructure. I just want to give my kids some land so that they can go figure out their housing, right? And then the kids get the land. And then the county says, okay, well, you can't get a permit unless you do this, this, and this, and this. And then five years, ten years later. <coughs> I mean, there's, there's a reason why there's monster homes right. on Oahu who try to control that. There's a reason we're trying to crack down on Airbnbs and so forth. But the reality is, as we live in an island state, there's only so much land. We could look like Hong Kong if we wanted to. Well, also, you end up in a situation where you, for example, there, I would imagine a lot of those might be either ag lots or subdivisions where you get X amount of floor space per yeah. area. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know. But I, what I'm saying is that you got to allow for, for you got to meet people where they are. And, you know, there's a lot of people that will be satisfied living in an older style, you know, construction of a home. Um, the old, old styles, I mean, I was, you know, in the South Pacific, they have open, open designs that are very cheap to put together. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our codes say you can't do this, right? It just, if people want to build a certain type of structure and they want to live in their, they're happy with that, it meets basic health requirements, I think we should allow it. There are people would move into trailers, but we will never allow that. Tiny homes and other things, are, they're practical. <coughs> Even uh, Josh's blow up uh, tents for the Ohana zones. <laughs> oh, by the way, it's they're, called, they're uh, HODU is called Homeless Outreach and Navigation for okay. Unsheltered Persons. Okay, what's the Hawaiian translation? Turtle. Turtle. <laughs> okay, <there you> go. <laughs> okay, so um, I've got a number of questions about crime and punishment that I want to try and address. Ooh. Crime is spiking right now in our state every night on the news. We hear about another elderly resident being attacked. What is going on? What is being done to keep us safe? How big an issue is that in your district? Oh, I had a town hall meeting on crime and safety, and the people said, what the hell are you guys doing? And the police, nine policemen, I give HPD, hats off to HPD, nine policemen came and said, here's the state of the art in Hawaii Kai, here's the state of the art on Oahu. We are no different than any other place. A lot of theft going on, a lot of what is otherwise a revolving door that they mention, and half of the crimes were people who left keys in their car, left their doors open like the old Hawaii used to be. We can't trust people now as it was before. And the, the, the essence was we don't feel safe. That's one of the basic obligations of our society through our government. And 200, no, it's 312 HPD officers are actually short from what they should be in terms of their patrols. So we, we, we need to give them more pay. We need to get more of them. And all respect to the Senate and some of the other get out of jail free people in the House, we're making it too. We want to get rid of bail. We want to get rid of sentences. We want to keep people on the street. And these are the guys, they're very professional now. They have getaway cars. They have guys that go do the reconnaissance. They steal it and they're gone and they're not getting caught the way they used to be. It does bring up that, I think that's a fair to bring up that issue. That is where, that's, that's what might, you be, might be arguing about this year. You're going to have a bail a, reform. Yeah, bail. And you're going to have a, a proposal well, you know, bail, for a so, big new jail. So bail has become, you know, an economic issue, right? Mm -hmm. If you can afford it, you get out. And, you know, the reform is a national movement. It's the idea that, okay, bail should be based on, on the situation, right? It isn't just a monetary consideration. Will you show up for the trial? Will you be there? Are you, are you safe? I mean, if it's a violent crime, no bail. I mean, simple, right? But it's bail... 
it, it's a racial disparity issue too. It's, it, it affects, you know, uh, racial minorities mm -hmm. at a disproportionate rate. So you're saying it's got nothing to do with the people on the street doing all these crimes. The crime, why no, is the crime, say that. why is the crime ticking please don't, up? Please don't put that in our mouths. We didn't, no, I didn't no, say no, that. No, my point she, is why is it, we his said, question was why is crime ticking in all of Oahu? Why is it going up? No, no, my question is what do we do about it? Right. And that's what we're, we're talking about. And you know, I'm sorry, but the state is larger than Oahu. You know, I represent four islands in the state. That's Molokai, Lanai, Kaholawe, and most of Maui. We have our own county and another set of, circ of circumstances that are different. The Big Island is very, very different. Kauai and Ni'ihau, very, very different. So this is what's, you know, what we deal with when we hear at the legislatures, everything is based on Oahu numbers. Oahu mm -hmm. statistics, Oahu. So there's and not a crime wave on the neighborhood. Jean, no, no, Jean, I didn't say that. I just said that we have a different set of circumstances mm -hmm. and it's never really considered in the mix, right? You're spouting off all these numbers about Oahu. That's fine. But in our county, it's very different. So are you, are you suggesting, though, that in your, some constituencies in the neighbor island are a lot less worried about crime? It's not something Some constituents in, in, within my district still leave their doors open, still don't lock, still leave the cars, and, the, and their society is still intact in that way. So what are the others, challenges? Others are, are very, I mean, you know, the proliferation of guns in, in, the, in the districts have been a very, very major issue of the uptick in crime. You know, so we see guns in the remote areas of Maui now. Guns in that wasn't there two, three years ago. Well, I gotta take a little blame here. The media, in fact, does uh, latch on to these stories and put them on the front page. They lead the news. But in fact, the statistics show historically that Honolulu, for its size, is a pretty darn safe city. In terms of gun uh, deaths, uh, we are really quite low, and we have some very strict gun laws in the mm. state. Mm. When a horrific accident or attack happens like the was it the woman at Ala Moana or was it at Waikiki I can't remember well, all of the above all of the above and it's very it's horrifying but we do tend to latch on to that because it's up there in our face all well, the, the time. Well the police chief did say that yeah. we are involved we, we are having a spike right now yeah. of violent crime we, we do have a sort of set of pretty aggressive criminals and she said we're short-handed so yes those I mean, things are true but it has to be taken into account the longer view and by the way Yes, you do need to have more mail bail reform. You can't keep cramming people into O triple C or M triple C. Well, you have no more space. It's exactly, and so it's not just a matter of building a new prison, moving O triple C to Halava. You got to be able to deal with people that really are worthy of recidivism, and we can help them and rehabilitate them and have them serve society again. Okay, I'll repeat the numbers one more time. Uh, from Oahu, four six two five thousand. From uh, neighbor islands, eight hundred two three eight four eight four seven. Email at insights at pbs. Uh, we talked a little bit about the um, income in inequality earlier, and I think this topic, you know, it perhaps is one of the reasons we're seeing the spike in crime, or who knows. But what does the role of income equality have in our housing shortage? Is a specific question, and and how do you fix income equality in this? Is there a quick fix to income equality other than a minimum wage, which Pro is the next question? the economy, question. sir. What about the minimum grow, wage? Grow Specifically to you, Gene, what are the chances of the legislature raising the minimum wage? Uh, probably very high, actually. I, I said for my caucus, and people misinterpret, I said if it's a reasonable increase, we'll back it. I mean, it hasn't been raised for quite some time, but I think we need a training wage. There's a lot of young people who are not getting training because the minimum wage is so high, and we know AI is coming, artificial intelligence. A lot. If you, we push it too high, the machines are going to come and take over, or people will cut back on those who otherwise should be hired. So we have to have a very delicate balance. I know there was a sort of a, a disagreement between the tip credit and all the stuff that was with health insurance and the credit. But I think there's probably enough momentum, if you will, that there probably will be this time. What so the level is, well, but it's not a, it's not a quote, 17, 25, or a big, uh, you're going to make it I think in it's Hawaii. not as simple as a simple dollar amount. <clears throat> I think it's a package of benefits and a weighing and equalizing of what it is. How do you balance, for example, you know, uh, tip credits, uh, dollar amount for, for wages, benefits, um, employer contributions, all of these things. That, so Health insurance. Health insurance, all mm. of this, right? So that's the mix. And I think that if we just take one of these strands out and deal with it, it won't work. But if we take all of it together and start looking at how we can mix this up, how it can, you know, how it can come together and say that, okay, maybe, 
you know, maybe we have a, a tip credit and we have a training credit and we have these mm. other things. Um, there's a way of uh, reimbursing uh, employers at a certain point. You know, all of these things have to be discussed, but it's a package. How, how we put together you, that. How close are you to really having an agreement at the end of the session? Well, what I do know, the last session, it was about, I think it came down to a dollar amount. Yeah. Um, but, but I think this session, you know, I think there's an, at least that I know of a number of senators uh, that have been working on the package um, and trying to figure out how to put this together. I'm not sure if the House has been, if they've been talking to mm. each other, but I do know the Senate has. And the senators uh, that are working on this are, are looking at it as a package. Mm. I'm sure the House would do the same. One of the things, though, that has kind of taken a little bit of the attention away is the family leave issue. And minimum wage family leave is obviously a very important one. And the numbers aren't probably in yet for all of them, but I think that's the discussion that is going on now. And I'm sure the, the viewer who asked that question will be fully apprised of what probably in the next six weeks something is going to pop up. But, Daryl, you're getting to a more fundamental problem of how to solve income inequality. And I don't think when you have a place where, what is the, the current rate for a home on a wall? Is it 700? 790. No, no, 820. Yeah. I just talked to the real Well, that's yesterday. Hawaii Kai, James. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's all of Hawaii. Hawaii Kai is Hawaii. Including uh, it Maui, is. sir. Including yeah. Maui. No question. Always very high. But I think when at the federal level you're giving out a tax cut, as the Trump administration and the Republican-controlled Congress did, that benefit primarily the wealthiest 1% and the corporations, that certainly is not going to move towards income inequality in this country. You know, um, one of the things that uh, happened recently was in the defense authorization bill out of Congress, they approved, I think it's 12 weeks paid family leave. Actually, it's, it's actually mar marital leave, right? It's just for having a child. But that's a major benefit that every federal worker in Hawaii will have. Does that put pressure on the legislature to, like, duplicate that? For state workers, private yeah. I think we've got to work the numbers out. The way they, they put, as you said, 12 weeks of paid family leave for a new child is $3.3 billion over the next five years. So it's going to cost a little bit of money. So the state has got to weigh that vis-a-vis -vis what the feds have as a model. Are you talking about the federal bill that Brian Schatz was involved in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me ask this question. You know, we, in the, uh, of Sandy Ma from Common Cause, one of the things that happens, with, happens all the time with the minimum wage bill is a classic case where there's so many moving parts to the bill, and at the last minute, someone will come in and throw a bowling ball at the mix, and it just goes kapuj. Um, do you think that there's process problems at the legislature with that, where they're at the end, they're just negotiating among themselves, and you don't know who's in their ears, who's, who's influencing them? Well, definitely, uh, when it gets to conference committee, it's pitch black, and we don't know what's going on, and, you know, it's, it's not public, it's not open, uh, you know, the public can't see what's being discussed. And so, yes, there are process and transparency issues at the legislature. Were you at, sneaking at up on gut and replace, Daryl? No, I didn't see that as an intro to gut and replace. It sounded like gut and replace to me. It's well, a, if I can go back like to something that's germane to what we've been talking about and what Sandy's getting at, and a slight disagreement over what held up minimum wage. In fact, the DLLIR, the Labor Department, was telling Aaron Johansson. Well, saying it's a constitutional issue. Saying, it was, yeah, it was more than that. And this gets to that process question you're asking is, why didn't they work out those issues beforehand? Why couldn't they agree on something? Why couldn't they have passed a bill so they didn't have to go to conference committee? And I'm hoping that this time around uh, they will fix that. Well, to get back to gut and replace. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 nice you, segue. See, you were su too subtle, too subtle. No, we, uh, I knew I didn't have to be subtle. <laughs> we, uh, Common Cause Hawaii and the League of Women Voters uh, of Honolulu did file uh, litigation against the gut and replace uh, one particular bill, uh, and I believe it is in 2018. It was actually kind of an obscure bill. Uh, it was, yeah. Yeah, yes. It was like, I don't even remember what it was about. But it, uh, yes. Uh, um, it's I, okay. That's not important. Yeah. Uh, because one particular bill. It's the process you're talking about. Uh, uh, one particular bill in 2018, uh, uh, we lost at the trial court level and we appealed and that appeal, uh, we appealed to the Intermediate Court of Appeals and uh, we asked the Hawaii Supreme Court to take it up and the Hawaii Supreme Court has agreed to take it up and we are uh, waiting to see if uh, oral arguments will be scheduled. Let me, let me just quickly describe what got into place is for the benefit oh, yes. of our viewers. I think many of them know, but it's basically and there's some differences in definition of what gut and replace means. Yeah. Um, traditionally, a bill could go all the way through the legislature, or it could, 
and at the very end in conference committee, as long as the title of the bill is, has some similarity, the legislators can throw out all the content of that bill and put in a whole other bill that may or may not have gotten hearings in the past. One good example of that last year was, I think you were kind of involved with this one, was where the decision, the, they decided to reduce the size of the Board of Regents and basically make it 50-50 neighbor islands and Oahu. And that was a bill that had been rejected, although it did have hearings, and then gutted and replaced with that. All of a sudden you had that bill. The governor ultimately approved it. But that kind of a tactic, do you see legislators addressing that as a reform issue? Well, like, you know, we, you know, we, we have a rule in, against that? We have in the rules. And the rules basically say that the content has to be somewhere in the discussion of the bill. So, you know, the, that's the, the conference committee rules. And it says, uh, you know, okay, if it was brought up at, at one of the conference hearings and somebody put it on the record and said, what about this? Then, you know, then okay. So we try to enforce that. But, you know, you go, let's go back to the Constitutional Convention because the, the Constitutional Convention that created this had long discussions on this particular practice. You know, the idea that a bill is introduced and it, the Constitution says only one subject per bill mm -hmm. and the title has to match the bill. So that's the genesis of it, right? The title has to match the bill. Um, relating to taxation, you know, when I first got in many well, years ago... Well, those titles look like. Well, yeah. yes, but... When I got That's in pretty darn ago, broad. <laughs> I did a I did a bill to increase the um, the uh, earned income tax credit, and it became it was taken and used to raise taxes. You know, because the title said relating to taxes. So if the veteran lawmakers know that if you want to really control a bill, you limit its title. Um, the newer members come in and do very broad titles, and their bills get used for all sorts of stuff. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, though. You know, the, the framers of the Constitution had long discussions on this. I went back and read the, the you know, the, mid, the mid minutes on this, why, why it was there. The idea that it's there is that a bill, you have hearings and a bill should evolve. And you need a mechanism to change the bill. So that was the, the constitutional thinking of why they put that in there. I have some sympathies for all the arguments, and I've written ag primarily against the practice. But the House and Senate also have their own rules. The problem is that the Constitution requires the three hearings, mm -hmm. and that's really the rub there. The argument for having a government in place is, what if you need to do something in the middle of session? I think one example was when all that Turtle flooding, Bay. well, Turtle, Turtle Bay, Bay, but also the flooding, on, the flooding on Kauai oh. as well. It's 125 million, You right? needed to get money to help them, Oahu as well, and, and what else could you do? You had to take a vehicle. But the problem is, what if you so change the content of a bill that, that it's an objectionable issue, a controversial issue? No one's going to complain about relief for flooding, but they are going to complain about changing the border regions, as Jeff Portnoy is doing. Mm. And in that case, the public has been left out. They have not been allowed to testify on this totally new legislation. And that's why I thank Sandy for doing what she's doing. You guys have been very bold. You've been out front. But it's where, if we don't stop it, it's going to be where... And you, you can have an insert into the uh, caveat where if it's an emergency, gut and replace is fine. The volcano on the big island, et cetera, et cetera. The other flooding, et cetera. Sure. We have council representing us on gut and replace, and I don't feel like it's appropriate to talk about an issue that's pending litigation that's But you brought it up. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to defer that Daryl brought it up. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Suddenly he brought it I'm up. I'm just explaining procedurally where it's at uh, in the litigation process. It's called awkward day one. Okay. <laughs> Sandy's the only attorney among us. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm not going to argue the merits of the case. So uh -huh. I'm going to, now we have about t 10 or 11 minutes maybe left, 15 minutes at the most, and I've got quite a few questions and I want to kind of get through them to... Uh, you got any vaping questions? Uh, Shorter answers, right? You want. The speed round. <laughs> yeah, um, you, actually, to, the vaping issue did come up, and uh, the federal government has only taken what would be considered baby steps. Um, how important is that? Well, you so right now, you know, just yesterday and today, bills are circulating, and I've seen a number of bills banning uh, vaping. Yep. Numbers of other bills are saying that we should control, you know, so that the gamut is being introduced, which means it's a, it's a topic, it's something that I think we're going to take up. Uh, our reporter interviewed uh, Senator Baker, who heads the Health Committee, among other things. Yeah, uh, our bill. Right, and uh, it's not to end vaping 
per se, but perhaps ban vaping products, to ban flavored products, and the impetus behind this, because you're absolutely right, the federal, uh, what the feds did was really baby steps, but we're looking at a, a crisis among the youth of Hawaii, and that has been demonstrated by the statistics. I think that will be a very positive issue that a lot of people can get behind. As a reformed smoker, I thought vaping was just a great way of getting people off, but then I learned the FDA says, Vaping is not a smoking cessation device. I thought, what is it for? Well, it's making kids hooked on nicotine. Mm -hmm. And I can't see any value, unless for those who are older, who actually, uh, there's a few people, they don't have the numbers on this, but who have used it to get off actual tobacco and get out of the cancerous, uh, poisonous part of smoking. But people are dying from <laughs> vaping. Yeah, <laughs> especially oh, so THC. Good. THC and vaping is just really the medical kill combination. So, so the, short, the really short answer is yes, we're going to be dealing with it yeah. at the legislature yeah. this year. Next question. At, no, oh, no, at Common Cause Hawaii, we had received a question from the Honolulu City Council saying that the state had usurped the uh, council jurisdiction to also regulate vaping, mm. that they could have taken um, steps earlier to address the vaping epidemic within so the county was saying that because they didn't and the state did no i think what they're saying is that the state law preempts the counties it from does. doing yes. vaping yeah. legislation yes. and and the, the frustration was the state gave us says the counties can't do it but then they didn't do it either i think that's what mm. the, the the message right. has been oh, okay. so i mean do you, do you see the, the the legislature and you're being from a you know from a not Honolulu County, do you see the legislature saying, okay, if we can't come to grips with this issue, we'll, we'll, we'll let the counties do it? Or letting the county take stronger steps? Well, uh, you know, concurrent I, jurisdiction. I mean, I don't know, because yeah. that, that's a fair answer. I really don't know, because, you know, I mean, I, I come from the county level, and I really have advocated over the years for more home rule. Right. And I've always said, you know, let the, let the counties decide things. For example, the cell phone ban in Hawaii, you know, it was all four counties mm -hmm. that did it and before we could get it through the legislature. The only reason the legislature passed it was the federal government said, you're not going to get some money unless mm -hmm. you pass one. Mm -hmm. But there was one statewide in effect because every county passed it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a uh, viewer asked this question back again to the um, affordable housing issue. Nearly a quarter of homes in Hawaii are purchased by out-of-state buyers. I think there was just a briefing by the state economist where he said it's still 30% in some places, very high. 40% in Maui. 24% yeah. yeah. average across the state. And, you know, there are places like Vancouver, although it's, that's not a dictatorial country, uh, where they, they put like a 30 40% tax on out-of-state buyers or foreign buyers. Yeah, but, buyers. you know, we have, we have a federal constitution, things like interstate commerce and et cetera, that really makes it difficult. One of the tenets of, of the union the United States is that you have the right to buy property and you have the right to move anywhere within this union. What about just so, foreign buyers though? Could you do it with foreign buyers? Uh, no. Because they'll just form a local company and then buy it? Well, no, but it's the same thing. You know, they've always allowed foreigners to buy land. Okay, so now cannabis. Um, Major League Baseball recently <laughs> stopped testing for cannabis. Will the legislature pass protection for workers who consume medical cannabis under a current state law as recommended years ago to someone who really knows a lot about cannabis. Um, but um, what do you see on cannabis? I mean, you're, you've been very active on that. I've been trying to just legalize it and be done with it, right? And, and let the markets decide. Recreational you're talking about? Yeah, I've always had that on my agenda. I've always put that out. Um, but here's the thing, right? It's like alcohol. You don't, you don't uh, have an airline pilot or crane operator that can go to, go to work drunk. You're going to have regulations saying that, you know, certain industries, certain types of jobs, certain things that you, they can consume. I mean, I think that it has to be highly regulated, right? It's not a free-for-all. And you have to allow people um, that need it for medical use to have that. Yeah. And if they are doing it recreationally, that there's limits, right? You know, uh, speaking of baby steps, uh, on Saturday, the uh, decriminalization bill goes into effect where you can have three grams or less, which I think is about that it's much, joint. Yeah. <laughs> based what I see on the I movies and TV. <laughs> uh, but uh, it would be a, a fine, $130. There would also be uh, reports back to the legislature on how to improve it. Um, the legislature in its bill recognized the way the nation is going, and it is moving towards recreational mm -hmm. marijuana. And you once said once uh, that Hawaii tends to be ahead of the curve on a lot of things. And then we fall away. And then we fall way behind same-sex marriage, uh, medical marijuana, uh, until death with dignity until we eventually come ahead on this and I I agree with the senator that it's inevitable and frankly it's going to be the tax revenue to be 
to be uh, helped uh, helping but our Chad, general if, funds. Chad, if you look at the data, malware to a computer is what this recreational marijuana is going to be to the brains of our youth. We have enough lethargy in our economy, in our youth, in our brain power as a, as a country. If you want to put everybody into a sleep in a lull, yeah, let's do recreational marijuana. You got to look at what Colorado did, what the drug uh, fatalities are with the uh, street and the and the accidents. But you know what? They're bodies. smoking it anyway. It's, Wait, it's no, already which, happening. which is fine. We've got medical marijuana. We've got everybody who can do three ounces. But to have no, your nation grams. committed to recreational three ounces. Marijuana. Well, that's a big change. I mean, sorry, <laughs> three grams. You know, we're still on imperial systems. I'm sorry. But the rest of the world does grams. You're still but, stuck in imperial measures. But you guys fear <laughs> malware and spyware. Yeah. But I'll tell you, if you want to fry the brains of your youth, keep going in that direction. It's the wrong. I'm sympathetic direction. to the argument that marijuana can, in many ways, we are the things, meth. We are a lot already fewer the people meth that die from marijuana than they do from alcohol. This is and the tobacco. meth capital of America, right here. Well, meth is another drug. Okay, but speaking of you, another this drug. This is just uh, another gateway version I can of use it. One. No, um, okay, so <laughs> will the legislature address the and fund sustainability and climate adaption this session? We, you mentioned earlier about the roads. Yeah, I think, what they're, I think what this caller is asking about is the report of the Climate Change and Adaptation Commission. Okay. Right, which, uh, you know, actually the best thing that they, their 315 page report if you read the executive summary, they talk about some very difficult things. Well, number one is planned retreat, and that is what we're going to have to address. We did all the low-hanging fruit, all the easy stuff, you know, all the aspirational. We're going to have our energy reduction by a certain date. We're going to do these other things. Now the real hard part comes. We need to move that power plant off the coast somewhere inland. We need to move that wastewater treatment system inland. And how do we do it, and how do we do it quick? Because here's the thing. It's not a future event, it's a current event, right? So we often talk about climate change in the future tense. It's coming, it will happen. We're in the middle of it. And so we have, we have a, a crisis of how do we, how do we move? To, to build a new power plant, you know, in Maui they tell me it's 40 years of permitting. All the federal permits, all the local permits, all the state permits, everything. If we're going to move the power plant, we've got to find a way to do it very quickly. Uh, I agree with you uh, on this, but that mitigation and adaptation report, not a lot of things were adopted by the legislature. I think what happened well, was is there was a... I've introduced a couple of bills to adopt all of them. Well, that's great, but it didn't happen last session. I think you asked the Office of Planning to plan ahead for Hawaii 2050, but it seems like the legislature did drop the ball on that one. And I know that climate change is very much at the forefront of your priorities. Right, and, and you're right. You know, so this is the, the change I've seen with at least yeah. the senators. I'll speak for the senators because, you know, we, we have our retreats, we get together, we kind of like how we're going to move ahead. And the, the marked change that I saw with the senators is like, Okay, we need to do something. I'm Let me ask that from a Representative good Ward. Um, it's the economy, stupid. No. Well, I won't take that. Talking about thing. what's important in Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, I think there. I think climate change is important, but getting people to be able to live here, to have a house, to have a sense of well-being, you can get educated, and not shifting them off to the mainland. I think that should be the okay, major but, focus. Okay, but but I mean, climate change. I mean, is you, it, are yeah. you saying it's not something that you need to deal with? No, I'm saying it's there, but it's not the major priority. He said that may be a priority of the Senate. As I said from the very beginning, we've got to get the 30% that are not part of the whole sense of the Hawaiian economy. 70% are making in Hawaii, 30% are not. I mentioned what's going on in the Hawaiian community. Others who are coming, leaving, and kids are getting exported to the mainland. Let me that's ask a this, that's every every but let me family this, that's though. watching yes, you're is talking concerned about, is, about their children. You're talking about prioritizing that, but <clears throat> there's also a road falling into the ocean in Ha'ula, and, and West Maui is faces the same thing. We've got we've got coastal and, flooding. And we've got to deal with those things. Okay. But you've got to deal with the economy of which we haven't dealt with for decades and so decades. You, are you saying you would rather, and I don't mean to sound like I'm arguing with you, uh, Representative, but I just I want to make sure I understand. Earlier you said we should invest in a spaceport, we should invest in strategic uh, advantages. All of these things, yes. and those are investments too, right? That's well, money. The private tax well, breaks. But it's top, no, it's private sector primarily though. But then it's how do you get them to do that without? Okay. It's, you mentioned the, the, the film tax credit. The, the film tax credit is one of those, but in terms of the spaceport, we have people wanting to come here. We haven't even got the permit to get the spaceport license for... Well, it'll all be uh, moved if the airport is underwater. Well, <laughs> <Right. okay. laughs> we have so many priorities, but my first sense is the well-being of the people of Hawaii, with the homeless, those who have three or four jobs to make it, 
and those who are probably without the education that they need to make it in Hawaii without exporting their kids. I'm going to go back to Sandy Ma's uh, for the Common Causes uh, sweet spot because I did have several questions about um, voter registration. Uh, the idea of automatic voter registration as soon as they've uh, uh, you know made some contact with some government agency. The driver's license. Driver's yeah. licenses. Um, another one. Yes. Um, when we have an all-male voting, will we open ballots at the same time as the West Coast uh, national elections? Um, uh, boy, the county. That's like, a, we lot, haven't lot, of the county lot of different issues there. But I mean, what do you think is the, the number one thing you'd like to see in terms of getting more people to vote this year? Wow, those are a lot of different issues. So for how to get people to vote, um, that is a loaded question. Um, number one thing to get people... Uh, to get people to vote. You know, this is 2020. It is a huge election year. We have the national mm -hmm. elections um, for uh, Oahu. Um, five of our city council members are up. We have a mayor's election. We have a prosecutor's election. Um, our um, and entire uh, house legislature. So maybe, oh, excuse me. maybe people just get excited this year. I, I'm hoping people, oh, we have the Mauna Kea um, uh, issue. I mean, there are a lot of issues to be excited. it also. Let, um, me, let me ask yeah. Chad Blair, I, I, we only have about a minute yeah. left, so let me ask this question. It's an, it is an election year. Yeah. It's an election year for a lot of people in the city council, the mayor, three two-thirds of the legislature. Do you think that in a year like this, you were going to see a lot accomplished in this legislature. Well, we all know that <laughs> usually during an election year, it's not the time for the big ideas. And and from what I, I one of our reporters talked to a lawmaker said, you know, it's actually pretty quiet. I think people are just kind of waiting to see. And you got to face it, what we're dealing with at the national level is, and the international level with the, the Trump administration, the impeachment, the situation in Iran is really dampening down It's everything. depressing. Right? It is. I will answer one question. I, I'm not saying it's common causes real view. Real quickly, a ranked choice voting, I think, would be a good thing, where you could pick your top two Ooh. or three. Hey, we're all done. We, 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 yes. Let's go over time. We, need, <laughs> we support ranked choice voting. Well, our viewers for joining us tonight. We thank our guest, Senator Kalani English, Senate Majority Leader, Chad Blair, Politics and Opinion Editor for Honolulu Civil Beat, Representative Gene Ward, State House Minority Leader, and Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii. Next week, Insights asks, what's it going to take to solve our affordable housing crisis? Please join us. Until then, I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>